1839 is the year that they credit with the beginning of photography. There were two inventions. One was by Louis Daguerre. He invented a unique, you couldn't make duplicates, system. It was laterally reversed monochrome picture on a metal plate. It was called the daguerreotype. The other system produced an image on paper that was also monochromatic and tonally as well as laterally reversed, in other words, a negative. And the result was you press this negative against another piece of sensitive paper, you could produce a positive. You could make more than one. It evolved into the calotype or Talbot type, named after the inventor William Henry Fox Talbot. But the real deal was the invention of Fixer. They might have had images on paper and materials for hundreds of years. It is possible, but they couldn't fix them until they invented the sulfide Fixer, and that made photography possible. But photography, by the way, this is the first image of a human being ever captured on a photograph. The man was standing there having his shoes shined. Everybody else is moving and the chemicals are so slow that they just blur. You don't see them. This is a busy Parisian street. And once he moved and he took another frame, there it was. This is Talbot. This may have been the sort of thing that he kept in a box. By a candlelight, he could show friends an image but until they developed Fixer, that wasn't happening. So these are just some old, lovely pieces. Because I want to talk about other things than, than chemical photography today. And I think we need to put everything kind of in context. Because this is happening about the same time in the 1820s in South America. Simon Bolivar, he leads a revolution. Six countries gain independence from Spain, which was followed very quickly thereafter by the Monroe Doctrine, which claims U.S. dominance in the Western Hemisphere. And at the same time, basically 1833, the Factory Act abolishes slavery in British colonies. We didn't do that first. The British did. Actually, what we were doing in 1838, we were moving the native tribes on the Trail of Tears. Indian removal cost the death of one in four native peoples. 1830s, Emily Dickinson is writing. Edgar Allan Poe is publishing. 1825, the Erie Canal opens. Opened the Atlantic to the Great Lakes. 1831, McCormick invents the Reaper and the John Deere Plow. 1837 starts weaponizing even more so than ever before because by the 1880s, we now have rifles, artillery, shrapnel, revolvers, torpedoes. They were all invented by the 1880s. 1840s. We're going to start looking at Renaissance, early Renaissance photos here. You've got the Oregon Trail opening the western lands of America for settlement. You've got the war with Mexico in 46 and 48. 48, you've got the revolution in France, the rise of Napoleon, nephew of Napoleon I. You've got a new emperor. By 48, there are revolutions throughout Europe. 48 was the discovery of gold in the American West. Karl Marx wrote his Communist Manifesto in 1842. 44, you've got the you've got the telegraph, Samuel Morris's telegraph. It just totally transforms communication. You can now send and receive a coded signal through wires. It was 1866 that they laid a cable across the ocean and we could now communicate with Europe. 
1846, Elias Howe invents the sewing machine. In art, we are entering the modern world with neoclassicism and romanticism. Those periods are 1750 to 1850, basically. Neoclassicism is the revival of classical antiquity. It's linked to the Enlightenment thought. Romanticism refers more to an attitude of mind. We've left the gaudy Rococo era behind. There was a call for a return to reason, away from the decorative Rococo, a return to nature and morality. The center of art passed from Italy to the northern countries. The French became the inheritors and self-proclaimed guardians of the great traditions of Western art. It became a matter of content as much as style how people now painted the lower classes. You didn't used to see fishermen of any sort. By the way, this is a grand painting. It's in Boston if you ever go up there. Go see it. But now they were painting the lower classes. The pictures are actually sermons. There was natural virtue and honest sentiment. They're no longer interested in the mere giving of pleasure like the frivolous artists of the Rococo who were repaid by kings and princes and popes. In sculpture, they were told to imitate the glory of the Greeks, even though most of what they considered Greek was mechanical Roman copies of no great distinction. Modern classics were to be judged on the basis of equality with the great ancient predecessors. Could it be more boring than that? There's George Washington. In architecture, we see a return to the old ways in the Palladian revival, compact, simple, geometric. They are quite lovely. In America, it became known as the Georgian style, Jefferson's Monticello is the greatest of these homes. In America, the Hudson River School was growing. Up until the 1820s, Americans were too busy carving out a country. But now that the wilderness was being tamed, there were calls for artists to depict it. This is not the Hudson River School. It's coming up. We're still in Europe here. Things always recycle. Neo-Renaissance and then Neo-Baroque replace Neoclassicism, and into this era came the Industrial Revolution. Everything decorative, porcelain, silverware, drapery, furniture became mass-produced to meet the demands of the rapidly growing middle class. It was in this period of art for the masses that Daguerre and Talbot made their discoveries kind of dovetails nicely with what's happening in the rest of the world that, that this new art for the masses, because in the old days, you had to be pretty rich to have your portrait done. But now, just about anyone could get a portrait done by a photographer. But of course, as soon as they invented photography, the next question was, yes, it's nice, but is it art? People drew and then painted. They're lovely, aren't they? But uh, perspective is not there. They're more idealized than formally, properly laid out, shall we say. Here we are painting the lower classes, the noble lower classes. All very romantic. There's Turner, 
This is a painting of a slave ship. You didn't see that in the old days. And a railroad. This is Hudson River School. And here we have David Hockney. We're going to retreat for a moment from the Renaissance and shortly thereafter. And if you've ever studied the Renaissance, the early Renaissance is very different from the late Renaissance. Even when I was a student, I looked at those two and I thought, there has to be mirrors, lenses, something made this radical change. But I did not have the discipline or the know-how or the time and the money to research this project. But one of my favorite painters, David Hockney, did. He wrote a book called Secret Knowledge. Here you see him using a camera lucinda. A camera lucinda is a prism on a stick, basically. It creates the illusion of an image of whatever is in front of it on a piece of paper below. It is not real. There is not actually an image on the paper. It only seems to be to the artist. These are some early drawings of people that he's collected. These are his drawings done of the guards at one of his show. Don't they kind of resemble each other? This is Madame LeBlanc by Ingres. This is 1823. This is 15 years before the invention of chemical photography. Look at the patterned fabric. I mean, just look at that fabric, how detailed it is. This is Cezanne's study of a curtain. This is eyeballed. Could you have eyeballed that? I don't think so. Hockney says absolutely not. And he knows that Ingres, in later years, used photographs to make paintings. He would have known about the camera obscura. He could have used that. Optics seemed to be the only way that you could do this portrait. This is a classic early portrait from the Renaissance. The folds are just kind of suggested. The perspective is absolutely terrible. But that's not what import what's important. And the face, very flat. This portrait, however, is completely different. Not that long in time from the first one, but it's miles, miles away. And Hockney maintains that they were using probably camera lucindas for these portraits. Vermeer was thought to have used a camera obscura. That's a pinhole camera, basically in a room. I'll show you some examples coming up. This is an early Renaissance portrait. later. Now don't you agree? That comes completely out of the mind of the artist. Something's helping the artist here. Look at the fabric. You can't eyeball that. That's eyeballed. Possibly models. Maybe not. These people had optical help. Here's armor, eyeballed. Suddenly, look at it and look at the faces. Shadows, harsh, you know, they've all got harsh lighting now. Back here, this lighting is all kind of vague and general. Now, we're talking lighting. Now, 
this angel is playing, I believe you would call that a lute. That's difficult to do. And it's okay. But then, you know, something's going on here. Here you have winged angels, early Renaissance winged angels. Pretty vague. Caravaggio's angels, now they have wings. Caravaggio was known to pick up street boys and make them his models. And he probably used eagle's wings and he probably used camera lucinda or obscura to do this. And this is 1599. And the contemporary criticism of Caravaggio was he can't paint without models. I find that fairly hilarious myself. If you ever get to see a painting of his, I want you to walk up close. He had a wicked sense of humor. He'd paint these little angels from these live street boys. If you walk up close, you'll see their dirty fingernails. It's really, it's quite wonderful. Now the popes had the best of everything, of course. This painting on the left was done in 1475 by Malozo da Forli. There's no evidence of optics. The close-up next to it is from a portrait that Raphael did in 1518 and 19. That's the Pope's hands. That's a lens in the hands of the Pope. And suddenly we've gone from just crazy perspective. They don't have a clue what they're doing with perspective here to pretty amazing perspective. Perspective's always been a real trick and people always had devices. Dürer had this technical aid using strings. This is 1525 so that he could have some idea of the foreshortening of this instrument. Caravaggio in 1595 had the benefit of optics and look at the the difference is just night and day. That's the old style and the new style. Hans Holbein's painted the ambassadors in 1533 and this painting is absolutely chock full of curved and spherical objects. They are impossible to, ob to eyeball. People avoided these like the plague. You might have a lute poorly done in an early painting, but all of a sudden it's like, look at me. I can make the drapery. I can make the globe. I can make the instrument. I can make the skull. It is this huge leap. And some of these pieces they're, they're actually absolutely photographic in the focus. With a camera obscura, which has no lens, it's totally different from what a lens would give you because a lens throws things in and out of focus. The near basket is a lot vaguer than the basket, the one on top, in the background because of the, the focus. And they love the fact that they got to paint the underclasses because this woman is never going to whine to the painter, oh, my feet hurt, I'm going to sit down, like a rich woman would. She's just going to stand there. So they kind of love that. This is 1543, Lorenzo Lato, husband and wife. Look at the carpet. It goes in and out of focus like a lens would. It's quite wonderful, isn't it? This was painted in 1485 to 90. Hans Hemling, he used a device 50 years before this was painted. 30 years before Raphael painted the Pope in Rome. There's no way to get this. There's no way to do this without optics.
I mean, you can, you can, you can scope them out. You can see how many, how many vanishing points and, but really that wasn't done before optics. In portraits, the changes occur around 1420 to 30. Robert Campine's face looks modern. Clear lighting, shadows under the nose. It suggests a strong source of light. Portrait on the left, eh, vague. the light's really vague, of course. And then you get to the turbans. The guy on the left, the turban folds are just, they're so general. I mean, it's just like he's wearing a cake. But when you look at the guy on the right, the turban folds are not awkward. That's how a turban looks. His double chin is seen clearly. The other one, it's, you know, it's a vague chin. It's just there. The mouth and the eyes give intensity to the appearance instead of just kind of hanging in the face. This painting has a totally, totally different look. Look at these, early and late. Something is happening here. They're lovely. But they had mirrors and they had lenses. There's a picture showing the lens and showing the reflection in the lens. You can actually make a room into a camera. You, you black out the room, you cut a hole in a board. Now you can do it with a mirror and bounce it over to the side, or you can let the image just come to the back room, pin up a piece of paper on the wall. Depending on if you use the mirror or not, you can bounce it around and turn it around. If you have someone sit outside in the sunlight and you're in the dark, you can see the face on the paper. 15th and 16th century, there are written accounts of this. There's a pope with lenses. There's Hockney sitting in a room with his friend outside. Now he's using a mirror so the image bounces back onto the wall and turns it but doesn't flip it right side up. You need prisms and like our modern cameras. But this is Hockney. Here he's showing how he does it with his friends sitting outside. He's got this room set up inside that's darkened. And there's the formal portrait. But suddenly, back then in the Renaissance, all these portraits are looking startlingly alike. They're similar in scale and composition and lighting. They look as if they've been seen through a window. This is from Van Eyck's, Van Eyck's Arnolfini wedding, 1434. The convex mirror you would need to do this portrait is pictured in the portrait. That's it in close up. You can see the back of the couple in the mirror. This is a, a pretty cosmic joke. And there is the portrait with the mirror that you would need to do this portrait in the background. The chandelier, if you look close at that chandelier, it's not shot from, it's not viewed from down below. It's really head on. So Hockney thinks that he did it separately from head on and then 
put it into the painting, pieced it together. Whoops. This is a nativity scene by Hugo van der Goes. It has a multi-window perspective. If you look at it, every one of those portraits appears to be done from the same angle and then inserted into the portrait. Those guys in the front, really, you'd be looking down on them a little more, but you're not. The angle is straight ahead, flat on, and then they're all pieced together. As Hockney does with one of his photographic portraits. Isn't that lovely? Hockney is one of my favorites, one of my favorite painters, one of my favorite photographers. And he's breaking it down piece by piece here to show you that he thinks this is how they were all done individually. Hands, faces, windows, mantles, chandeliers, plates, they're all from the same angle and then pieced together. Here's another piece done the same way. And all the little details. And when you look at them, they're all, all done from this very same angle. Remarkable, isn't it? I think it's just incredible. And when you, when you look at it like this, it's just, it's, I think it's indisputable. Here's one of his pieces with a Renaissance piece. And they are, they're laid out just the same. Here's some images of Hockney's taken with his camera obscura. There's the device on the top left. It's kind of difficult to see. Now, here we come back to one of my favorite painters, Caravaggio. We know that in 1595, he was in possession of a lens. Now, this portrait was made with a mirror. Notice he's got the grapes in the right hand. By the time we get to this portrait, it was made with a lens. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, people are becoming left-handed, which is unlikely unless you take into account the lens reverses the image. It's not that all drinkers became left-handed all of a sudden, 40 years and, 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 and now everyone's a lefty? Forty years later, after these left-handed portraits, good quality flat mirrors reverse the images back. Did Leonardo use lenses? Here's an early Madonna. Here's his latest. Now really, when you look at them, flat lighting, flat, you know, the lines in her face, not just kind of vague, that he put a lot of care in the hair, the shadows are vague, and then here she comes. Shadows, the shadows really, I think, are the major thing that's the difference. They're way more real. You go from vaguely women to women. You go from vaguely landscape to landscape. Could there be anything else other than lenses responsible?
when you look at that cowl on the top one, it's just apparent to me that that has to be done. The bottom one could be suggested. The top one, not so much. France Halls, 1626 to 8. They're amazing portraits. And there's no charcoal underneath. Look at this. Look at this. Foreshortening is incredibly hard to do. Look at the hand. Who can do that? The most talented artist, that is, is incredibly difficult. But when you understand that there's no charcoal underdrawing, nothing but paint, this has to be an optical base. Look at that gorgeous hand. Now, Peter Paul Rubens was a master draftsman. Master. Beautiful. He left lots of drawings behind. But guys like Diego Velicas, no drawings, no drawings. And look at these faces. They're amazing. I'm not saying that's not beautiful. It is beautiful. But it's totally in a different realm than this painting. Rubens, fabulous. He is an incredible draftsman. They're beautiful. But they're not like these portraits. And another thing that you can do with optics is change the size. And if you look at the portrait on the right, depending on where you shoot from, is how the person's going to look. If you look at someone head on, it's going to make a slightly awkward point, to, you know, top to bottom. But if you're looking from below, he's going to appeal much taller and much more regal. It was the 4th century BC when Aristotle wrote about the phenomena of the camera obscura. He was apparently walking through a very, very dense forest, totally covered, when a little crack in the forest canopy allowed the image of the moon to, project, to be projected on the forest floor. And it was an aha moment, and so that was the first camera obscura. It was 1806 when the camera Lucinda, the prism, was patented. So look at the table on the top, how the objects are laid out. Now that, no prism was used here. That's got to be a prism, don't you think? Now it doesn't guarantee a great work of art. This is a great work of art. No prism used here. This is a great painter. Now this is a bad painting using optics. This woman was put on a platform. Look at her hand, her right hand. It's holding the edge of the platform. And then the sea, it's, it's a dreadful portrait. The sea was put in behind her, but this is definitely use of optics. Here's, your, here's how the little room works, the camera obscura, upside down and backwards, but it is projected on the back wall. You can do this. There's a, a photographer currently, and I'll look him up for you, who does hotel rooms all around the world. He makes the hotel room into a camera obscura, and then he photographs the image that is projected to the city that he's in outside his hotel room on the back wall, and he photographs it. They're quite wonderful. Here are just some gadgets that people would use back then to make their portraits. All kinds of cool optics. The one on the, the printing on the right, bottom right, is Leonardo's. Lots of people knew. It was a secret 
It was uh, a trick. Lots of people knew. This one, this last one, you can see the little camera obscura on the bottom right, and the little angel is holding the lens. Tricks of the trade. So, here we are. We've led all the way up to lenses, camera obscuras, camera lucindas, and now we have the optics and we have the fixer. So, our next lecture will be on the start of chemical photography. See you soon.